ahead, everyone. I think as people start coming in, I'll start out with the introductions. So um, I'm Dr. Chaya Morali. I'm one of the pediatric genetics physicians here at Texas Children's and Baylor College of Medicine. And I'm excited to welcome you guys tonight. So tonight is our Evenings with Genetics webinar. Um, it is, I guess, probably the fourth or fifth one of this year. And the title is CRISPR Genome Editing, Treating Human Disease and Ethical Considerations. This series is sponsored by the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine, as well as Texas Children's Hospital, all here in Houston, Texas. Spanish interpretation will be provided thanks to Mercedes Alejandro. And to listen, you can click on, I believe, the interpretation box on the bottom of your screen. During the webinar, you can enter questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll answer as many as possible, either by typing or live during the webinar. This webinar is being reported, recorded, and it will be posted on our website, www.bcm.edu slash evening genetics. We have two speakers this evening, Dr. Jason Heaney and Ms. Sarah Huguenard. And I'll introduce them both today because they'll be tag teaming the presentation. So Dr. Jason Heaney received his BS in biochemistry from the University of New Hampshire and his PhD in physiology from Penn State University. Then he completed a postdoctoral fellowship in developmental biology and genetics at Case Western Reserve University, focusing on the developmental origins and genetic risk factors of testicular germ cell tumors. Dr. Heaney joined the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics in 2012 and he now runs a research program that uses mouse models and genome editing technologies to annotate gene function and the contribution to human disease. Dr. Heaney is the director of the BCM Genetically Engineered Rodent Models Corps, director of the BCM Center for Precision, Precision Medicine Models, a principal investigator of the Knockout Mouse Phenotyping Project, and a principal investigator of the BCM Rice Small Animal Testing Center of the Somatic Cell Genome Editing Program. Sarah Huguenard is a native Houstonian who received her BA in biology and religious studies and a minor in bioethics from the University of Virginia in 2013. She received her MS in genetic counseling from the University of Texas Health Science Center in 2015. Sarah is a clinical genetic counselor who sees patients at the preconception, prenatal, and oncology settings at more than 10 clinics in the greater Houston area, and she also performs telecounseling. She is active in the genetic counseling program here at Baylor College of Medicine, where she teaches a course on genetic counseling ethics. And so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Heaney and Sarah, and thank you for your attendance, and we look forward to hearing this wonderful presentation. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, everyone, for um, for calling in and, and attending today. Um, so um, I, I, I think Sarah and I forgot to put this on. I, I have no conflicts to report for this talk. I, I believe Sarah does not have any conflicts either. Um, so just started off with that. <clears throat> the other thing that we wanted to start off with um, as everyone's showing up, um, just to kind of gauge where everybody is as far as whether or not they've even ever heard of what we're talking about today. So I'm going to launch a poll um, that people can answer, asking if you've ever heard of genome editing or CRISPR. And I'll give a few seconds to see what people say about this. Oh, I love it. People are actually using the poll. Can I do this in class? That never happens. <laughs> okay, so the exciting news is that, oh, still people are still answering. The vast majority of folks appear to um, have heard of uh, CRISPR, our genome editing technology, which is fantastic. So we at least have a basis to start off with that we've heard we've heard about this. So, um, so the, great. Thank you everyone for um, I can share the results, um, and thanks everyone for, for responding to that. Um, so Sarah and I are going to tag team this talk, so we're going to bounce back and forth. Um, I'm going to give Sarah access to the remote control here. Um, There we go. Um, so we're gonna bounce back and forth a bit, um, dealing with some major sections. Um, so stick with us if there's some technology snafus as we go through the process of doing that. We practice it and it should work fine. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first start off talking a little bit about um, genome editing technologies in general um, and how they work um, with a little bit of focus on CRISPR. 
Um, and then we're going to get into a little bit more about the applications for um, for uh, treating or pre uh, um, or preventing human human genetic disease, um, and then some clinical ethics at the end. So, um, just to start off with a simple definition of genome editing, um, it entails the modification of DNA sequences in living cells for the purposes of determining, changing, or expanding their function. Um, so simplest thing we're, we're really going at um, trying to to um, to change the function or, or of genes so this occurs in two steps um, which I'll talk about in these two steps separately first it occurs by targeting nucleases when the easiest thing to think of these as is molecular scissors to a specific DNA sequence someplace in in your cells in the genome of those cells so it's going to target some specific gene of, of interest those nucleases or molecular scissors, when they're delivered to that specific spot in the D your DNA sequence of a cell, um, cuts the DNA, creating a double strand break. And that double strand break is actually the basis through which genome editing is, can occur in the way in how we actually are able to use genome editing um, to eventually uh, um, to modify a gene in, in, in a cell. Um, and that's because when DNA damage occurs or these DNA breaks occur, the DNA damage needs to be repaired by the cell. And it's that repair process that we use for genome editing. So how do we actually do that first part, which is targeting those molecular scissors to someplace specific site in the billions of bases in your, in your DNA sequence of a cell to cut that DNA at that specific spot? So that delivery, that specific delivery can be done in one of two ways. Um, and I'm going to first review a couple of ways that um, were the original technologies used for genome editing um, before CRISPR, which we'll talk about in a second, um, became developed later on. So these first two technologies um, deliver en enzymes or proteins that cut DNA through protein DNA interactions. And it's this particular uh, makeup or sequence of these proteins that determine what parts, of, what sequence of DNA will be targeted for DNA break. So one of the first technologies that was developed, and this was actually shown to work back in the, uh, the mid 1990s, are zinc fingered nucleases. They're abbreviated ZFNs. These use protein sequences that have little domains on them that recognize, and this is a strand of DNA, and these little bars represent DNA base pairs that recognize groups of three bases. And these can be put together and programmed to, in which together can go in and recognize, in this case, it's three domains, three amino acids, three uh, bases each that recognize nine base sequence someplace in the genome. This delivers one part of a, of a, nu of a nuclease called FOC1 that's able to, to cut the DNA. The problem is FOC1 nucleases require two of them to be present to actually achieve a DNA break. So when we use these protein targeted nucleases to someplace in the genome, we actually have to deliver them in pairs. So we also have to target the other strand of DNA with these proteins that recognize another set of DNA sequences at the target site to deliver the complementary part of the protein. And it's together that these two parts of the protein, this dimer as referred to it, will mediate a cut of the DNA and will create a double strand break. Talons, which are an abbreviation for transcription activator-like effector nucleases, do a very similar type of thing where the protein sequence determines what DNA sequence will be targeted for, for, um, for, DNA, for DNA break or DNA cut. And in this case, we have elements of this protein sequence, which are shown here by these multicolored um, ovals, that each recognize a specific base. And in this case, these each recognize the same base, like this yellow bar could be an A, um, the green bar could be a T in the DNA sequence. And it's this combination of these little elements together that, that, in, that basically encode what the protein will recognize in the DNA sequence. Just like with the zinc finger nucleases, we need to deliver two, two copies of this protein to the site to mediate the double strand break and it's breaking the DNA. So again, we have to target sequences on one side of where we want to cut and sequences on the other side we want to cut, bring these both together to create a double strand break. So again, this is a, using proteins that we can um, generate in the laboratory and that we can generate and encode to target basically any region of, of the genome, the billions of cells, uh, billions of bases in a particular cell of your body to create this double strand break. 
In much the same way, we can do this using um, what we call an RNA targeted um, uh, endonuclease. And this is basically what CRISPR technology is. So CRISPR stands for Clustered Regulator Regu Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic um, Repeats. Sorry, I was blocking something. Um, and this is a technology that was actually, who was actually derived from bacteria. So this CRISPR, these, these CRISPR um, technology that we use originated from bacteria and it was used in, by bacteria as an, as an immune response to invading uh, um, viruses that try to infect them. And it actually, in much the same way, uses these nuclease activities that cut DNA to cut the, the virus DNA so it can't actually infect the cell. So we've actually adopted this technology to use it in cells of, of humans and animals, which we'll talk a little bit about later, um, to do the same type of uh, generating of DNA strain breaks. So I'll just walk through this technology a little bit. So there's two components to talk about with CRISPR um, genome editing. The first is the Cas9 protein. This is the nuclease. This is the thing that will act, the protein that will actually cut the DNA. Um, and this protein has the capacity to cut both strands just by delivering one copy of the protein at some site in the DNA of a cell. The other part of it is an RNA, which is a single-stranded um, ribonucleic acid molecule, very much like DNA, but it's a single strand rather than a double strand. And that this RNA molecule is actually what guides the Cas9 protein to a location in the genome to target for generating a double strand break. This RNA molecule, when we introduce the protein and the RNA molecule into the cell, they'll form a complex together, and the RNA will guide the Cas9 proteins to the location in the genome, and they'll form basically a connection between the RNA molecule and the DNA molecule at that site. The RNA basically forms base pairs with one strand of the DNA and dislocates the other strand. And this site is where the DNA cut will occur. There's one additional trick for getting Cas9 to actually go ahead and cut the DNA. And that's what's shown here in yellow. And this is what's referred to as um, a spacer sequence. There's other names for it that I won't get into. It's a very specific sequence that needs to be present next to where the RNA molecule binds. And that sequence is necessary to change the shape of the Cas9 protein so it can actually physically create the cut. If that sequence was not there next to the target sequence, the Cas9 protein would not be able to cut the DNA. Every Cas9 derived from bacteria, and there's Cas9 proteins that, are, that we've found in a variety of different types of bacteria, have a different type of spacer sequence that needs to be present next to these, these target sites for that cut to happen. Um, and it's, that's part of how we determine the specificity of the fact that that cut's going to happen at that specific location. And again, just like the other nucleases we talked about before, um, the Cas9 will cut the DNA and will create this double strand break and that will eventually need to be repaired. So again, both of these technology types actually create these double strand breaks. And it's that break that is the basis of genome editing. So how does that actually happen? So we have a DNA break and now needs to be repaired and that's what the cell is going to do. It, it detects that DNA break and it needs to go through the process of repairing it when we use that repair process for genome editing. And how, so how does that work? And again, this is true for all the, tech, all the different technologies I just talked about. So once the double strand break is, is um, created, there's basically one of two pathways that a cell can use to repair that DNA break. One is more random. Um, it's actually called non-homologous end joining, um, if you wanna know the name of the, of the DNA repair process. And basically, I think of it as a uh, gluing the ends back together. It's not precise. Um, and what can happen is during that, that process of basically gluing or sticking those ends of DNA back together, one of two things can happen. Extra bases can be added in, or like A, T, Cs, and Gs can be added in at that site, which are represented by these alternatively colored lines here. Or extra bases can be removed from these ends um, for example, the yellow and the green bases here during, during the process of putting this back together. This is the pro called random insertion of, sequence of, of bases and random deletion of bases. And it's this process by when this happens, depending on how we actually, what sequences we choose to, to, um, to target in the gene can actually turn off the function of the gene. 
In this case, we could potentially be turning off the function of a dysfunctional gene that creates an abnormal protein that's causing, let's say, um, some kind of disease. The other process is more precise, and you can think of this as almost like precisely stitching the ends of the DNA back together to repair it to the point that it almost looks like it originally did. To do this, we have to, in, when we introduce the, the genome editing materials we all into a cell, we also have to introduce what we refer to as a donor DNA. This donor DNA acts as a template or a guide for mediating the precise um, stitching back together of these DNA ends. So this donor DNA has sequences that match the yellow bases over here. It has sequences that match the green bases over here. We could just put this back together in a way that just repairs exactly what we did. The fun trick to this though, is that we could actually put new bases inside of them. And during the DNA, inside between these two matching ends of the, to this particular cut DNA. And by doing this, we can actually add, remove, or change a base that had been present at this cut site. And this allows us to basically repair a genetic lesion or genetic mutation at the particular site. So I've counted them so I could, I could mention this. There's actually 10 um, purple uh, bases that are shown here in this diagram. So let's say that there is a disease that's caused by a 10 base deletion at this site. We can actually put those bases back in to turn the gene function back on. So then this is called homology directed repair. And these are the two main mechanisms that are used by a cell for repairing DNA that we've now recruited to allow us to do what we refer to as genome editing. So then the question then becomes, we talked about three technologies, zinc finger nucleases, halins, and CRISPR. They all do the same thing, but over time, and some of you may know, CRISPR has become the dominant technology that we use in the laboratory for research and for, for clinical trials for treatment of human diseases. Um, and the question is, why has that become the dominant technology? And it basically comes down to three things. One, they're easier to design than, than the, the, the protein-based genome editing systems. It's just from, just from a standpoint of, of, of picking where we're going to do the editing and designing the things that will, that will target those sequences easier to design. They're also much easier to produce in the laboratory. Um, and they have good editing efficiency. So they work just as efficiently as the two technologies. But because they are so much easier for us to work with in the laboratory and to build the tools and the, and the components that allow genome editing, we've moved to those particular this particular technology as the one that's become predominant um, in the use in the genome editing field. Okay. And now I'm gonna, um, Sarah's gonna, we're gonna switch over and Sarah's gonna talk about, uh, begin talking about how CRISPR is actually used today. Fantastic. So now that you're familiar with how gene editing works and what it is, we're going to talk, as Jason mentioned, about some practical applications of how CRISPR is being used today. And that will be followed by a discussion of the ethical implications of using this technology and some considerations that we'll, we'll need to be thinking about. So probably didn't expect to see a, a cow in this presentation today, but this is Cosmo. Cosmo was born on April 7th, 2020 in the Bay Area of California. And he is here today because he was the first cow to have his genome edited in order to alter the sex of his offspring. So in order to explain how this works, I'm going to take you back to high school biology class for a moment to show you a picture of DNA. Many of you may be very familiar uh, with, with this picture, uh, but DNA, as you may know, comes in packages called chromosomes, which come in pairs. So within each pair, one copy comes from mom and one copy comes from dad. In humans, we have 23 pairs, but this is a picture of a cow's chromosomes, and they have 30 pairs of these chromosomes. So this last pair here uh, dictates whether a cow develops as male or female, and that's true of humans as well. So here we have a male, XY, whereas females are XX. Uh, so there is a specific gene that's located on the Y chromosome called SRY, and this is the gene that makes an animal or a human develop as male. And since females don't have a Y chromosome and therefore don't have an SRY gene, uh, they'll develop as female. 
So what researchers did with COSMO is that they used CRISPR technology to add a copy of this SRY gene or the male development gene, you could say, uh, to one of COSMO's chromosome 17. Uh, of course, when COSMO has offspring, half of them will inherit his Y chromosome, which would make them male, and then half of them would inherit his X chromosome, which would make them typically female, but half of those uh, offspring that inherit that X chromosome and would normally be female will also inherit this copy of chromosome 17 that includes that SRY gene and will develop as males. So therefore, 75% of Cosmo's offspring will be male. And as you can imagine, this has huge implications for uh, the, the beef industry. CRISPR is also currently being used uh, to increase viral resistance in some animals. Uh, so one, one application of this is uh, in the pork industry. So for the past 34 years, the pork industry has been fighting a uh, viral disease uh, called PRRS. And this PRRS has plagued the, the pork industry um, and, and is something that they, they think about on a daily and weekly basis. So re researchers have used CRISPR to edit a gene that makes these pigs more resistant to PRRS, which has made a huge impact on the, on the pork industry. And CRISPR is not only useful for increasing resistance to viruses, such as the applications in animals that we talked about, it also has the ability to detect viruses. So if you think about, uh, you know, CRISPR is designed to target specific nucleotide sequences, which are building blocks of DNA, uh, and therefore it's also capable of detecting specific RNA sequences or the building blocks of viruses. And researchers have developed a test that uses CRISPR technology to diagnose COVID-19 within about 20 minutes. This very practical, easy test has received FDA approval for emergency use authorization to be used within certain uh, certified clinical labs. Uh, developers are still working to get it up to par uh, in terms of its operation to be able to operate within any setting. Uh, so you can imagine that potentially in the future, if needed, uh, this technology could be used in businesses or even in homes uh, to have an answer as to whether you're infected with COVID-19 within 20 minutes or so. I'll pass it over to, to Jason to give us a little bit more uh, background before we delve into the, the clinical trials and uses in humans. Great. So um, now we're going to talk a little bit about um, the way that CRISPR is be in genome editing in general is being used to um, treat and potentially cure um, uh, human genetic uh, diseases. Um, so, and we're going to go through basically what are the three fundamental approaches that we can use to um, help ameliorate uh, genetic disease in individuals. And we're gonna walk each uh, through each one of them um, separately. Um, so the first approach is what we refer to as ex vivo um, somatic editing um, therapy. Um, and really the easiest way to think about this is that in this process, the, some, some type of cell is collected from an individual is, and is taken into the lab and is grown in, in, in culture dishes. And, um, where, and, and we'll talk a little bit about in a second about the cell types where this can happen. Those cells grown in, in these culture dishes can then, um, we can then introduce genome editing systems like the CRISPR genome editing systems into those cells to edit their DNA to create some kind of, to, um, to, uh, to amend or, 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 or do genome editing at a locus on a, or on a gene that's causing a particular um, genetic disease. Um, and again, we can use either the two types of approaches where we're just pasting the ends back together or doing more precise um, uh, uh, repair of the, of the sequence. So we can do that in the dish. And we've gotten very, we're very good and have been very good at many years for actually being able to introduce things into cells in the dish. It's not a very, for most cell types, it's not a very difficult process. Once those cells go through the process of, of having the genome editing materials and components delivered into them, we can then collect those, some of those cells back and actually ask what happened within that, with the cells that were being cultured. Did we have the genome editing event that we wanted to have happen occur? And we can look at that on the DNA level. And we can also ask questions about, did we see events happen that we didn't want to have to, didn't want to occur? And we'll talk about off-target 
genome editing a little bit later and other types of events that we would wanna look for. Once we do that, and we sometimes have capacities of selecting out specific cells that were the right things have happened, um, we, we now have these verified cells that have had some kind of gene editing occur that has corrected the function of a gene or turned off the, turned off the function of a gene that was, that was abnormal to begin with and put those cells back into the body of the individual. Now those cells have been corrected and can hopefully work normally and ameliorate, correct, cure whatever disorder the individual had now that they have cells containing, um, you know, back to a normally functioning gene. This process is most easily done with cells that we are very proficient at, at basically doing this process of culturing outside the body. One of the main cell types that we can often take this approach with, and we'll actually talk about a clinical trial example of this process in a bit, um, are the stem cells or the progenitor cells um, for white blood cells and, and red blood cells that circulate throughout the body. So hematopoietic stem cells is the name from them, or bone marrow type cells. Um, we're very proficient at taking those out of the body, growing them in culture, doing genome editing, and putting them back in where they can populate the bone marrow again and pr provide normally functioning either red or white blood cells. A more complicated way of using the genome editing to for thera therapeutic approaches is referred to as in vivo somatic editing. And in this process, rather than taking the cells out of the patient's body, correcting them and putting them back in, we're now going to introduce into the body of the individual the components of a genome editing system. So it will do the genome editing within, within the body. To do this, we need to have a mechanism of delivering these materials to the right, the genome editing cells, to the right cell types and the right tissues and have the right events happen within the body. One of the issues with this approach, which we'll talk about in a second, is that we're actually doing the genome editing in the body, and there's no way for us to pre-screen the cells, like for ex vivo editing, that we're putting back in. So we have to have very good confidence about exactly what types of events our genome editing system will create if we take this type of approach. So again, we have to have a mechanism putting these materials into the body and delivering them to the tissue or the cell types that we want to get them to. Um, and in this process, which is called somatic editing, we're going to be targeting tissues like the lung or the liver um, or the, the intestinal tract. So those gene and editing events will only happen in those cell types. They will not happen in other cell types like sperm or eggs. So we're not going to be editing cells that basically, like sperm and eggs, that will give rise to or the next generation or the offspring of these individuals. So these changes that we're creating using this approach are not passed on to the next generation. The other approach for doing this, the third approach, is in vitro germline editing. And in this case, we're actually going to um, build on the process of in vitro fertilization to do genome editing in a mouse, uh, sorry, no, in a human embryo. This is what happens when you work with mice in the lab. And so we're doing genome editing in a human embryo. So just like it starts off with a normal in, in vitro fertilization process where we create very early stage embryos, um, which we can um, grow out in, in, in dishes in the laboratory, which is a normal part of in vitro fertilization. During that process, we can introduce genome editing uh, components into these early embryos. At the stages that we introduce the genome editing components to these embryos, the cells that comprise the embryo have not established what types of tissues that they eventually are going to give rise to. So it hasn't been decided that this cell is going to be turn into liver, a liver cell, this cell is going to turn into a lung cell. These are undetermined cells. So when we do the genome editing at this at the stage, these cells will all give will give rise to all the tissues of the re, of the resulting um, embryo and then child. So in this case, when we do this, we're going to also be doing genome editing in throughout the body, including sperm and eggs. So these embryos, when, when after doing the genome editing, um, uh, pre-implantation uh, genetic diagnosis can be used um, on some of the, the cells from the embryo to determine what kind of editing events happen. Those embryos can be grown out a little bit more and then put back um, and, and, uh, and transferred into, um, into a woman to be carried and give birth to a, to a child. And again, this can be, this can be used to correct um, a genetic uh, 
uh, variation or mutation that causes a specific disease. The problem with this approach though, is that we are editing all the cells of the, of, of the individual that will be born, including the sperm and eggs, which means that if they have children, that genetic change will be passed on to the next generation. So not only are we editing that particular individual, we're editing all the generations of people that will come down off of that particular individual. And we'll talk about the ethical implications of that in a bit. Um, but that is the, the approach that currently, at least within the United States and most countries is, is currently banned. So just to, to focus in on this in vivo genome editing approach, this is really the approach that we're looking at getting to as we can only do ex vivo genome editing on certain cell types. There are other cell types that we wanna be able to correct where we're gonna to have to actually go into the body and do the genome editing um, directly in, in the individual. So we have to have mechanisms of delivering these, the genome editing components to let's say the liver or the lung or even the brain, basically any organ that you can think of. So we have to be able to target those specific tissues and organs and, and, and just not have the materials delivered to those specific cells, but to have them de efficiently delivered to those cells. We need to have them delivered to the majority of the cells and particular target tissue or organs. So we have tools to do that. Um, and gene therapy and using other types of approaches have been, has been done for quite some time now, using this, these same types of approaches for targeting specific um, areas of the body. So viral, what we refer to as viral vectors. So these are virus-based delivery systems that are built off of naturally occurring viruses like lentivirus, adenovirus, and adeno-associated virus. In the genome editing field, adeno-associated virus um, is uh, one of the primary uh, viral vectors that's used. Um, humans typically have a very low in, uh, in, in immune response to these um, viral vectors when they're put into the body. Um, and there are a variety of different types of them, which we call serotypes, that have naturally occurring preference for, for um, infecting cells of specific tissues. Um, like for example, adeno-associated virus eight prefers to target um, the cells of the liver. We can also use nanoparticles. Um, so these can be gold nanoparticles, iron oxide, or lipid-based nanoparticles um, that are basically you know, small molecules that can basically encapsulate and enclose the genome editing components that we want to introduce um, into the body. Um, and people are working on generating these types of particles that will home into specific um, types of tissues. However, the primary easiest purpose in use is when we can directly administer these particles to a particular um, tissue. If you think of like the lung, um, and the lung, um, the, 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 the cells of the lung that are responsible for taking in oxygen when we breathe, and they're called epithelial cells, those cells we can basically like through an inhaler or some nebulizing agent can introduce nanoparticles that will basically coat the inside of the lung and will have direct contact with those cells and can be taken up very easily to perform genome editing. So nanoparticles are being very closely looked at for genome editing approaches to deal with cystic fibrosis. So again, nanoparticles have somewhat of a sp specific purpose when we can do this direct application or direct introduction. Despite the fact that we have these, there's significant room for improvement um, because there are some particular issues with some of these types of particles. So one of the issues with doing this direct delivery is dealing with tissue specificity and efficiency of these types of delivery systems. Again, when we're talking about doing genome editing in the body. So like, for example, I said adeno-associated virus 8 has a preference for the liver and cells of the liver. However, it can go to other tissues, infect other cells of other tissues and do genome editing there. Typically for genome editing therapy, when we think of the way that we're using it, we really want to do the editing in, the, in a specific cell type and in the smallest number of cells possible to have the benefit to the patient. So if the disease is being caused by a change of, in, in a gene and the resulting protein of a cell, an affecting cell function in the liver specifically, then we want to deliver it specifically to the liver cells. We don't necessarily have to have it go other places. And we also have room for improvement of efficiency of, action, of the delivery. The second issue is of human immune responses to the delivery vehicles and the Cas9 protein that's used to cut the DNA when we use CRISPR editing technologies. 
So many of the viruses, as I mentioned, we, there are innate immune, uh, there are human immune responses when they're introduced. Um, adeno-associated virus, there is some immune response. Adenovirus, there's definitely an immune response. Um, and the Cas9, as I mentioned before, we've actually recruited it or adopted it for this approach from bacteria. All of us have been exposed to um, uh, Staphylococcus and other types of bacteria, and we've built an immune response to components of those bacteria. Those are the same bacteria that Cas9 comes from. So many individuals actually will have an, an, an immune reaction, not reaction, or have an immune response to, in response to Cas9 will have, through that immune response, can potentially decrease the, the efficiency of Cas9 working as it could potentially cause those cells to, to, um, to die that are affected by it. So we have to work around these issues and improve these types of approaches. The other issues that can come up is that these DNA repair processes, although we've talked about them as, as you know, we have, we have known expectations, um, there's a couple of things that can happen. Um, first is the precise DNA repair, this process where we use a DNA donor, is very difficult to occur in many types of what we refer to as somatic tissues. So think of neurons, cardiomyocytes, um, like cardi the, the muscle cells of the, of the heart and the muscle cells of, of other parts of your body. That's because for this process to happen, um, for this type of DNA repair to occur, the cells need to be actively dividing. Most mature cells like neurons don't actively divide. They're more resting mature cells. So this process really can't, doesn't work well in those cell types. It works well in things like stem cells that are actively dividing, however. So that's a potential issue and is why from a lot of the currently being uh, uh, genome editing technologies going to tech clinical trials, this approach of this more gene inactivation approach um, through this process is being utilized. It does not require a dividing cell. Any cell can do this type of DNA repair. The other problem is that although we have ideas of how the, what genome editing events will happen, sometimes unexpected genome editing events can happen at these sites. When DNA is cut, there can sometimes be very large deletions that can happen. Um, the donor DNA repair, repair process doesn't always go uh, perfectly. Um, and there is always the probability of us causing a, a bigger problem at the gene, in the gene that we're targeting for gene editing than, um, than what we really wanted to start it off with to begin with. So a lot of um, testing needs to go in, needs to occur to understand how frequently these, these undesired events happen relative to the desired events. And then finally, what people would probably refer to as the, the biggest potential Achilles heel of CRISPR genome editing technology is what we refer to as off-target genome editing. So one of the issues of, of CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technology is that it uses an RNA molecule, which is shown here, to target a specific DNA sequence. And the RNA and the DNA basically create a double strand, just like DNA normally is um, a double strand. And that pairing does not need to be specific. So if there's another site someplace in the genome of the cell and some other chromosome that has a similar sequence that's one base different, so there's an, a T instead of an A, or there's one base missing, or there's one base added, that, that RNA molecule can actually sometimes form a pair and create a double strand break someplace else in the genome that you didn't want to create it. And it's always possible if we do that, if that's in another gene, we could actually turn off the function of another gene that was, that's critical to the, to the function of that cell. And we really need to be careful when we pick these guide RNAs, especially for, gene, for, for doing gene editing for therapy, that these types of events either never occur or occur at locations in, 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 on chromosomes or the genomes of the cells that are likely to have no effect on cell function. So all of those issues are being addressed by many people across the, the, the U.S. and internationally. Within the United States, um, one of the programs that, that I'm part of that's addressing this is referred to as a somatic cell genome editing program. It involves um, several dozen sites um, across the research sites across the United States that are looking at developing um, novel um, genome editing um, components. So Cas9 molecules from different bacterial species, other things other than Cas9, 
new delivery tools that are more efficient um, and more specific, um, developing um, platforms for testing using um, tissue culture and animal models to test the safety and efficacy of genome editing approaches, um, and then making this information available to the research community to try to improve how we use genome editing for therapeutics. Um, and these are a, a website that describes that program at the NIH, and there's actually a YouTube video that describes the program as well. Um, so, um, so that's kind of where we are with the technology for doing genome editing in, in people for, for correcting genetic disease. So where are we actually with clinical trials and, and using these technologies? So this is a, um, a table from a publication from 2019 that basically summarizes all the clinical trials using genome editing technologies from 2009 to 2019. It's probably too small for everyone to read. One of the things I will point out from this table though, as we go down and through time from 2009 to 2019, you actually see a shift from using zinc finger nucleases, which came first, tailins that came second, and then eventually mostly Cas9 or, or, or CRISPR technology. So you can actually see the shift as one technology is easier to use beyond the other, the preceding technologies of what's being used within particular clinical trials. Um, and there's plenty more that have now, in the last couple of years that have come online, they're basically all using CRISPR technology. Um, and Sarah now is gonna talk a little bit about some of those trials that are, that are underway. Yes, so one of these first CRISPR-Cas9 trials is in patients like Victoria Gray, who's pictured here, who have sickle cell disease. And as you may know, sickle cell disease is an inherited blood disorder that affects between 70,000 to 100,000 Americans uh, currently. So people with sickle cell have severe uh, pain episodes that often require hospitalization and blood transfusion and the disease can shorten someone's lifespan. So this, this clinical trial is ex vivo. Uh, and as Jason explained to us, this means that some of uh, Victoria's cells are removed, repaired, and then returned to her body so that they can function as they should. And Victoria is the first person to receive CRISPR therapy for sickle cell disease, and she celebrated one year symptom-free in 2020. Um, another condition uh, currently being treated with CRISPR therapy in clinical trials is called Leber's congenital amaurosis type 10. And this condition is the leading cause of congenital blindness in children. And so the CRISPR therapy uh, is actually administered directly to the eye in order to improve vision and potentially allow individuals to see perhaps for the first time. Uh, so clinical trials for, um, are underway for gene editing for other genetic conditions as well, like Hunter syndrome, hemophilia, and beta thalassemia with varying results. Um, but as Jason mentioned earlier, you'll note that these initial clinical trials using CRISPR are treating conditions wherein it's easy to, uh, or easier to deliver uh, the CRISPR therapy either directly to the affected tissue or to uh, remove and replace the cells um, that, that are targeted. So our blood and our eyes are easily accessible. Uh, when we need to treat organs and systems such as connective tissue, skeleton, the brain, getting the, the, the delivery of, of the CRISPR therapy to the cells uh, that's needed to edit becomes much more complex and more challenging. So this clinical trial with Leber's congenital amaurosis type 10 is an in vivo uh, example of an in vivo clinical trial uh, as the therapy is delivered directly uh, to the eye. So CRISPR use in humans currently goes beyond treating hereditary diseases uh, as this technology is also being used to treat certain cancers in clinical trials. So CRISPR therapy is used to harness the power of a person's immune system. And the, the T cells, which are shown here in green, uh, are the part of the immune system that identifies specific foreign particles. And so in these, in these uh, clinical trials, T cells are removed, which means it's an ex vivo uh, uh, trial, and they're reprogrammed using CRISPR technology uh, in order to be able to recognize cancer cells, surround and destroy the cancer cells. 
Uh, and I should mention, if you're interested in the scientific details of how CRISPR is used, specifically in these three trials, we'd be happy to address that during the, the Q&A portion. So let us know if that would be something of, of interest to you. Um, but these are just three uh, quick examples. And as you can see, there are a lot of exciting applications of CRISPR technology that are already being used uh, in clinical trials to detect and, uh, to, to detect and treat disease. Uh, and therefore improve people's lives. Um, but the rise of gene editing technology uh, brings about a lot of questions about how, when, and why to use this technology in a responsible manner. So I'm going to now delve into more of the ethical complexities surrounding the use of gene editing technology. Before I do, I want to send out a, a quick poll to gauge the audience. Our question is, is it okay to modify the DNA of the next generation? It's okay if you need a minute to think about it. A lot of people spend their careers on this, this question. Um, so some yes, some no, and some sometimes. My my students who are on will tell you that I love I love the gray. I love it when when we disagree and can have a, a fruitful uh, discussion about something that's that's so important as this. Um, Great, thank you for those, those who responded to the poll. Very, very interesting, I love it. Um, so, you know, in order to discuss the ethical implications of a new technology, it's important first to understand how it's different from what's previously been done. So prior to this gene editing technology being available, um, we currently have the ability to uh, detect whether a genetic disease has been inherited. And this can be done at several points. Uh, it can be done um, either after a baby's born, during a pregnancy, or even testing embryos prior to a pregnancy uh, using it for, for couples who are undergoing in vitro fertilization, as Jason explained to us. Um, so the, the question that we can currently answer is, was it inherited or was it not? And I've gone a slide further than I meant to. Um, there that was my fault. I apologize, sir. No, no worries. Um, we're, we're figuring out this, this remote control feature of Zoom, which is fantastic. I think all of us are learning more about Zoom this year than we ever hoped to. Um, but I digress. So, so currently the question that we can answer with available technology in clinic is, was it inherited or was it not? But gene uh, editing technology or CRISPR technology specifically allows scientists not just to detect whether it was inherited, uh, but to make changes to the DNA that exists as you, you well know the, the details of by this point. Uh, so we're moving now in our discussion from talking about somatic gene editing, uh, which is what's used in the, the clinical trials that we discussed. And we're going to talk a bit about what about this germline editing. And I think this is what a lot of people think of when they think of uses of CRISPR uh, or, or just genome editing in general, uh, is, is this technology that can be uh, passed down genetic changes or genetic edits to the next generation. So because of this heritability aspect, ethical discussions about germline gene editing are much more complex and difficult. Um, so, you know, while germline editing may harken sci-fi, futurist, futuristic images, uh, the use of this technology is, for better or for worse, already here. Um, Going back to 2015, 2016, when it became clear that this technology um, was going to be able to be used um, from a scientific standpoint in the germline uh, very soon, the international uh, bioethics community and societies agreed that while research in clinical trials should proceed uh, for somatic gene editing, when we talk about germline editing or editing the DNA that's passed down to offspring uh, should be strictly controlled and should not be implemented yet in a clinical setting until much more of the scientific kinks and ethical considerations had been worked out. But in spite of this, 
In 2018, this individual, Dr. Hay, announced to the world that he had already edited the embryos of an ongoing twin pregnancy and uh, another pregnancy as well to make these embryos and uh, at the time of the announcement fetuses uh, more resistant to HIV. Uh, the parents of these pregnancies were HIV positive, and Dr. Hay had made a change in a gene called CCR5. This gene is known to, uh, or the specific change that he made in this gene is known to make people more resistant to contracting HIV. It was important to note, though, that while his justification was that this would reduce the chance of these babies contracting HIV from mom, there are other measures other than gene editing that are uh, standard of care uh, that are already in place to, to do just that. So scientists actually speculate that Dr. Hay may have chosen this gene uh, to edit uh, for not for its HIV resistant capabilities as he purported, but actually for its known association with higher intelligence. So the international bioethics community, of course, was outraged at this announcement uh, because Dr. Hay had edited the embryos without any oversight. He'd also done this without the proper consent of the parents and without uh, the equivalent of an institutional review board oversight. So uh, recently he's been sentenced to three years in prison in China where, where he lives and works. Uh, and he's also uh, received a fine that's equivalent to 430,000 US dollars. So needless to say, this is not an ideal start to human germline editing. Uh, and there's hope that the, the repercussions of Dr. Hayes actions will discourage uh, scientists from going rogue uh, in germline editing until there's much more data about how to use it safely and ethically. So I, I imagine that since you're here, you likely have heard the term designer babies before. I know that I hear it a lot when I tell people that I'm a genetic counselor. Sometimes that's the, the first question that people ask is about designer babies, although that's of course not what, what we do. Um, most people think of you know, looks, superior intelligence, or increased athleticism when they think of this term designer babies. Uh, but there are a lot of complexities, um, including that there's not just one gene for eye color, nor is there an intelligence gene. Uh, but in reality, there are likely dozens of these genes that interact to determine these traits in a person. So for personality and aptitude traits, you know, we don't even completely understand how much genetics as a whole contributes to those traits versus the environment. Uh, much less understand which genes uh, make up the building blocks to, to cause those traits in an individual. So we have a long way to go to be able to identify the involved genes, be able to target them, be able to edit them, tweak them for the desired result. So additionally, the more tweaks or edits you make, you can appreciate the more complex the process of doing this becomes from a scientific standpoint. But currently there are some traits uh, for example, such as dementia, obesity, muscle tone, uh, wherein we know one or a handful uh, or a few dozen perhaps puzzle pieces uh, that, that make up those traits, but we are a very long way from knowing what the entire puzzle looks like, much less being able to change the puzzle. And just because we're a long way off though, doesn't mean that we'll never, never get there. And so bioethicists agree that now uh, is the time to debate and discuss how and when this technology should be used. So what should we use this technology for? Uh, this gene editing discussion really became hot as uh, Horizons began to broaden through the Human Genome Project, which, as you probably know, uh, first mapped the human genome in the 1990s and early 2000s uh, before CRISPR technology was developed. And a common thought process at the outset of this discussion was that gene editing should be limited to treatments uh, and not allowed uh, for enhancements. So allowed for treatments such as to uh, cure sickle cell disease, like we've been talking about, um, but should not be used for enhancements such as improving someone's intelligence. Some people disagreed uh, with this, saying that the technology should not be used at all uh, under any circumstances for fear of playing God. 
Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, though, others felt that this technology should be available in any application uh, to, to individuals who wanted it. So despite these debates, uh, the categories of treatment and enhancement appear at the outset to be deceptively clear, um, but it gets complex very quickly. So for example, think about that CCR5 gene that Dr. Hay had edited. It, even if his goal was to you know, reduce the risk for HIV transmission, what do we do with that uh, potential for higher intelligence as a result of this particular edit? Um, has this side effect crossed into the territory of enhancement? And then what about preventing obesity, say? Is this a treatment or does this qualify as an enhancement? So again, although this distinction between treatment and enhancement appears at first straightforward, most bioethicists now dismiss it because the lines become gray too quickly. Uh, so this is a really difficult discussion of, of trying to figure out in which scenarios it is responsible or morally, uh, uh, morally responsible or ethical uh, to use this technology. Another gray line that we run into is potentially putting parents into the position of having to determine what's acceptable for a child. And some people worry that parents may sometimes have ulterior motives in making these decisions for their children or may not have their future child's best interest at heart. Uh, so I've pulled a few concerns that have been published by scientists and bioethicists that demonstrate really the wide spectrum of thought on this topic, even from within the scientific community. And keep in mind, this is before we even uh, uh, branch out into the thoughts of the general public. Um, so I thought these were, were notable. Um, a, a researcher uh, uh, was quoted in a journal called Science saying, would it be appropriate to use the technology to change a disease causing genetic mutation to a se sequence more typical among healthy people? This highlights the nuance of that uh, very gray line between treatment and enhancement. What about a sequence that's just more typical among healthy people? A uh, cardiologist at UCSF, uh, Ethan Weiss said, if we have a chance to edit congenital blindness out of an embryo, should we? Changing my daughter's disability would have made us and her different in a way that we would have regretted. So this quote, I think, highlights the impact uh, that disability can have on families. And we, especially as clinicians, tend to, to think first of the negative impacts of disease on families. But what about the, the character building, the positive, the, the uh, relationship building aspects that it can sometimes have for some families? Another quote, uh, anyone who has to actually face the reality of one of these diseases is not going to have a remote compunction about thinking that there is any moral issue at all. So this individual would be on the other end of the spectrum uh, in the camp of we should uh, allow uh, any use of this technology uh, that, we, that we possibly can. And finally, uh, professor in disability studies at Emory says, at our peril, we are right now trying to decide what ways of being in the world ought to be eliminated. So if these quotes have made you feel uncomfortable and unsure, you're in the right place. Um, this is a, th these are very complex uh, topics to be thinking about. Um, so these quotations are only a, a taste of the diversity and thought of opinion and opinions on germline gene editing in, in our society. And finally, on top of that, if we were to come to some sort of societal consensus or agreement on the kinds of situations in which germline editing is acceptable, we would also need to then have discussions about who has access to these services, who's going to pay for it. If we use in vitro fertilization as an example, uh, a, a building block, uh, since we're currently, uh, you know, IVF is currently available, most insurances provide unfortunately little to no coverage for these services, uh, even if there is a genetic risk in the family. We're seeing that slowly, slowly change over time, but this has really been a struggle for families uh, opting for, for IVF for one reason or another. 
CRISPR technology for germline editing will likely be much more costly, much more complex uh, than in vitro fertilization and even pre-implantation genetic testing itself is. So should, in, sh should insurance cover it? Uh, will the availability of this technology then contribute to already widening socioeconomic gaps? Uh, if so, is this okay? Um, and then if parents in theory have the option to correct a genetic condition or prevent it from happening, would society then place an obligation on parents to make use of this technology? And potentially this could increase discrimination against individuals with certain uh, heritable conditions. So I appreciate that I'm leaving you with more questions than answers about the moral and ethical acceptability of germline gene editing, uh, but that is where bioethicists and society as a whole must start in an effort to responsibly introduce gene editing technology. So finally, we uh, have pulled a few articles of interest. If you would like to do any further reading uh, of really the high points of what we've talked about today, um, and I appreciate these are not easy to click on, so um, you can check those out in the recording or we'd be happy to email them to you if you would like. Um, with that, uh, we will transition into our Q&A portion. So I'll invite Shia back uh, to, to help us out with the Q&A version. Thank you to Sarah and Dr. Healy for such a wonderful presentation. Um, you definitely simulate a lot of great questions in the chat box. So I will read out a few of these to you. Um, and what, one thing I was thinking about, if one of y'all is able to, if you're not, it's okay, but um, those links that you had put on your final slide, perhaps you can put them in the chat function that available to all the participants. That way they can click on them if they'd like to. Yeah, I, I can do that right now. Yep. Fantastic. Um, so we have a question, um, um, can we use donor DNA, I think this is when you were first introducing CRISPR, um, to modify the oncogenes in cancerous cells? I need to unmute myself, sorry. Um, the, the answer is yes, um, and people have been thinking about this, and there's plenty of um, experimental data and animal models that have done, looked at and done exactly that. The key to that, just like the key of the key to everything else, is um, targeting those specific cells and getting into a tumor mass. Um, and that's really, again, it's all it all comes back to delivery um, and the efficiency of delivery and the efficiency of hitting the entire cell population. Um, so one could imagine a resected tumor and with margins and maybe introducing nanoparticles at the surgery site to deal with any kind of potential cells in the surrounding area and targeting an oncogene that yes, it is, would be an Achilles heel for that type of cancer. So those things are absolutely being looked at, but again, the key is getting the materials to enough of the cells to, um, for that to happen, so. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, we have another one. Um, somebody had asked, how soon can people with sickle cell disease benefit from the success of the CRISPR technology that um, I think it was Victoria Gray benefited from? Yes, so there are, I'll, I'll let Jason an answer this as well, but um, there are more than one uh, trial, uh, sickle cell disease related trials uh, using CRISPR-Cas9 technology currently underway. Um, and I, since this technology is so new and uh, is, you know, currently it's in the, the clinical trial phase rather than in the clinically available phase um, for, for all of these conditions, um, I think it's a bit difficult to predict how soon this will be clinically available to all patients with sickle cell disease. Um, but individuals with sickle cell disease certainly are, um, you know, can, can sign up uh, for these clinical trials to find out whether or not they qualify. Uh, to participate if that's something of interest. Uh, Jason, do you have any other comment on the, the timeline for these things? I actually, I actually don't. Um, I, one thing I did look at though, um, see how, oh, it actually worked. Um, pasted them into the chat. Um, one thing that I did take a look at though was the time frame in which the, the, the genome editing approach actually leads to um, most a shift in the, and again, we can get into the technology of this if we really wanted to, shifts to getting normal hemoglobin function in, in red blood cells and preventing the sickle cell issues. Um, it's actually quite fast um, once these cells are put back into the body. We're talking months of, of 
ameliorating the the, ba the basis of the of the sickle cell disease. So that part I can answer. How quickly it works when it's used is fairly quick and it's very efficient. Um, the few individuals that have gotten it, they see a very rapid and widespread um, uh, response. So. Great. So I'm um, going to bounce around a little bit here. There was a question that I think I had a little bit of trouble understanding. We can see if this individual can clarify if we need to. Um, but the question was, if an individual has been living with a genetic disorder for years, his or her body has developed compensating mechanisms. After CRISPR, is it reasonable to expect that these compensating mechanisms can be reversed in short order without serious consequences? Oh, I'd have to think about what disease, uh, what, what state you're talking about. Now, you know, the, I, for, for correction of blindness and maybe, you know, individuals be more attuned to hearing, that, that I don't know if it's a, is, a, is really a compensation versus a kind of, that's a nature versus nurture type of a thing, just becoming more familiar with, with your sounds and your environment. So sure, something like that might be lost over time. You're actually talking more about a bio, like a physiological response um, to that change. It probably would depend on the, on the particular uh, disease or situation that's being that's being targeted. Um, I don't think that there's really anything that would. I would maybe for metabolic diseases would be a little bit more complicated and con with compensatory mechanisms and other pathways that are involved. So sure, there could be potential issues, but. Just like everything else in science, that never would happen. I mean, we do our best to test those questions in cells and in animal models before going into people. Let's slow walk it into people to begin with. So I would say, I, I always say that nothing in biology is absolute. When someone tells you there's a rule for something, um, the rule will be broken. So um, that's that would be my, my quick answer to that question. That's a good rule. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about is, you know, in folks with, say, disorders where you have hepatomegaly or storage of certain things or things like things that kind of develop over time, I yep. think even if you were to correct the, the genetic anomaly, you might have difficulty reversing certain things and sort of you know, like spasticity that develops over time and things like that. Yeah. So there were, yeah, there will be some things that will be difficult to, to, to change like that. Yeah. So definitely. Oh, oh okay. I, I think the, the person clarified it was about autism. So yeah, I think that's, that comes back to kind of that nature versus nurture that you were talking about. I think so one of the, one of the issues about just quickly on, on brain and brain development, you know, so you're there, there's, there's, you know, issues with, with changing the neurological pattern and, and, and patterning of neurological connections in the brain versus dealing with, you know, a neurotransmitter disorder where that might cause, you know, um, might cause seizures or might cause um, tremors or something like that, where that could, the basis could just be, you know, continuous stimulate. I mean, there are going to be certain things that, that CRISPR technology will not be able to fix. So CRISPR is never probably, I mean, I'm not going to say never, it's not going to, not going to be able to be used to necessarily repattern, uh, you know, uh, you know, neur neuron connections very, very easily. So though those types of things are going to be a little bit harder, harder to deal with. So. Indeed. Um, so I'm going to try to do three more questions if you can. Um, and, so oh, sorry, I'll just add, unless you do it in children that have, that actually are going through active, um, you know, neurogenesis and pattern formation that, and everything we talk, you know, we, we show pictures of adults, but it, this can be done in pediatric settings as well. So again, it's one of those, if caught early enough questions, sorry. No, that's fine. Um, and so I'm trying to try to do three more really quickly. So one is still a little bit more medical and the other two are a little bit more kind of ethics related and uh, about resources. So the first question is, is it possible to use this technology for stimulating and repairing nerve cells in disabled patients? It, again, it depends on, on what the basis of it is. Um, again, if it's a patterning issue um, when, and how neurons are, con are connected to each other, it's going to be a more difficult story than um, if it's an issue of an abnormal neurotransmitter production, that's just affecting again how how the, the established patterns talk to talk to each other. So, I would say it's going to be the easiest question. So, we wait. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to end with I think you guys had already put a lot of resources with those links in the chat box. Somebody had asked a similar question: Are there any books, videos, or articles that the presenters recommend? So, are there any books or other things beyond what you had already listed here? Um, as was a question about eth more the ethical part of it or more of the Just science? CRISPR in general. 
Oh, if you if you go onto YouTube and CRISPR and Google CRISPR, Google CRISPR genome editing, there are so many. I literally almost thought about just playing a video. So um, there are so many videos, with very beautiful graphics about how this works. So yes, per, peruse at your at your own will. You will find lots of medical, you know, medical institutes and research institutes that have produced very very nice videos. So well, that's great. that are accessible to the general public. Wonderful. And then the very last question, how do you think the future of the profession of genetic counseling will change in, in relation to these new gene editing advances? So it's kind of in Sarah's court there. I, I wonder this all the time, and I am both excited and terrified uh, about it. Um, of course, if you think about uh, genetic counselors who practice in adult and pediatric settings, uh, the benefits are, are right there in front of us uh, and, and already you know, being implemented in these clinical trials as patients are able to receive treatment for diseases where, you know, previously we've only been able to provide band-aids that, that don't work super well in a lot of cases. Um, so, so that's very exciting um, in those settings. Uh, I, I practice primarily in a prenatal and preconception setting. And so um, this would really come into my court if, uh, if and when I should say uh, this technology is being implemented in the, the germline scenario that we, we've been talking about. Uh, and I think that once that technology is available, um, we'll have really another dimension of preconception uh, genetic testing. Uh, uh, or, or preconception genetic counseling, I should say, in exploring these complex ethical and moral uh, issues and questions with patients. Uh, you know, we, we have a little bit of a foundation for this in uh, exploring options for pre-implantation genetic testing with patients who are undergoing in vitro fertilization. Um, but as, as you can see, you know, that's, that's really our, our closest stepping point, whereas talking about uh, options and implications of CRISPR technology is, is much more complex and, and difficult to tease out. So I think that in the future, I guess the short answer would be yes. Um, but, but for the, the prenatal preconception genetic counselors, I think that's going to be a whole um, other you know, area of expertise that, that will need to be equipped for uh, guiding patients through those complex uh, and emotional decisions. Absolutely. Thank you for that answer. So um, uh, if you guys have any further kind of closing thoughts, otherwise I'll close out the session. All right. Well, thank um, you. It, I'll start with the science. It's, it's pushing forward. The people are pushing very hard on this. And this, um, at least the somatic editing, where we target specific tissues and cell types, um, it, it's, going, it's going to be a uh, thing that that uh, within the next few years, everyone you're going to probably end up knowing somebody that's that's had gene editing therapy. So it's it's going to be a much more common thing. It's there's there's not an end in sight on this one. It's it's the real it's the real deal. So and it's working, which is fantastic news. And uh, my my closing thought would be whether you're in the research arena or the clinic uh, or none of those things and have nothing to do with with science or medicine. Uh, in your profession, uh, please engage in these conversations because it's you know going to take a, a, a lot of discussion uh, and exploration for us to really think through how to responsibly implement these technologies, specifically with regard to germline editing. So um, to, tune into those discussions and, and let your voice be heard. And I'm excited to, to see where those discussions take us in the next years, decades. Right. Thank you both so much for a wonderful presentation. And thank you for all the attendees who have been here and have engaged with us in this wonderful presentation. Um, we do have evaluations that we like all our attendees to fill out so that we can improve our um, future evenings with genetics. Unfortunately, I don't have the link for you today, so I can't put it in the chat box. But what we will do is we'll email it to you tomorrow. It only takes about two minutes, so please do help us out by filling that out. Our next webinar will be on Tuesday, April 13th, and we'll be focusing on pharmacogenomics. And so we'd love it if you want, if you guys would join us again then. Um, and lastly, again, thank you to Dr. Heaney and Sarah for joining us and for giving us this talk today. And thank you to all the attendees. Have a good night. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.